When you reach the finale of 2008's indie classic Braid, you as the player get to witness Tim's reunion with the princess he's been trying to save for the entire game. She escapes the hands of her captor and cries for help, followed by an intense sequence where you help each other get away by opening doors and removing obstacles blocking your exit. When you reach the end, however, things aren't quite what they seem. If you rewind time, the game's signature mechanic, you realize Tim is the one hunting down the princess. And as you fight back through the same hallway, she releases traps and narrowly dodges your attempts at stopping her. The man at the end is actually her savior, and his dialogue takes on a whole new meaning. So using the exact same layout and path taken, an entirely different perspective emerges because of how the game frames your encounter. In game design, this principle is called… actually, I have no idea. I've searched high and low and cannot find an answer, so I think we need to come up with a new term here. Should we call it cyclical design? The old switcheroo? Nothing quite conveys the trope I'm talking about here, but I liked the suggestion on Twitter from Andreas Graham of using all the buffalo. You know, like how the Native Americans never let a part of their hunt go to waste. So I think we'll go with that for the sake of this video. Let's be a bit more exact with what I'm talking about here. To define using all the buffalo, I would say it's when the same game assets, whether it's level design, enemies, or specific mechanics, are used in multiple ways to lend a fresh approach to the gameplay or highlight particular story beats. So in our braid example, it doesn't really change anything on a mechanical level. You just hold the rewind button and it plays out for you. But throughout the same game, there are several times where an identical room layout or setup is used to show how a new addition to the gameplay can really switch up the solutions to puzzles. You fight this same monster two separate times in Braid. The first teaches you that if you replace the broken chandeliers, he'll retain the damage he received. But the second one makes it slightly harder by requiring the shadow version of the chandelier to do the damage so that you can release it multiple times. So while you could simply change the scenery of a game to show a stark contrast like the town square in Ocarina of Time, or to evoke certain emotions like the minute changes to the hallway in PT, it feels much more impactful and recognizable if it affects the gameplay in some way. It's almost easier to explain what this principle isn't rather than what it is. I'm not talking about when a stage has multiple paths like Sonic the Hedgehog, that's just building more areas to explore if you're skilled enough to reach them. And I'm also not talking about aesthetic nods, like Tropical Freeze's Last World paying homage to each of the areas in DKC Returns. While it's nice to reminisce about their predecessors, they're still completely different levels. Now obviously, these are fantastic elements to include in your game design. They just aren't quite using all the buffalo. We're talking about taking the exact same elements and repurposing them to switch things up. Let's look at a few more examples. The Messenger prides itself on using time portals to switch between 8-bit and 16-bit versions of its stages. But this is much more than just a graphical improvement. Certain pathways become blocked off or open up depending on which timeline you're in. And it'll change up hazards like the empty cloud ruins becoming a lightning-filled temple when you jump to the past. Wario Land 4 does something similar. Once you reach the end of a level and flip the switch, you need to backtrack to the beginning to leave. But some of the route you took is now obstructed, forcing you to explore and find a new way home. Now, what about enemy and obstacle design? Well, in Celeste, the very fireballs you're trying to avoid become helpful jump pads when you transform the level into its icy version. And the freaky eyeball monsters that hunt you down also provide a forceful boost when they come back to life. Scary to attempt, but a really cool little quirk. Rayman Legends is masterful at this. In the fourth world, they introduce these searchlights that you need to stealth your way around, otherwise you'll get a nasty shock. But that simple device is expanded in a variety of different ways. These spiky eels can harm you, but they also block the light. You can move wooden planks to hide behind, but also platform across. You even break into a mansion, cut the lights, and then have to sneak your way back past the added security. Something I found super clever was that they used identical copies of stages from Rayman Origins, but added in the newer collectibles of Teensies in different hiding spots. And that's probably the most blatant example of what we're talking about here. Oh, also, they have these belly-flopping luchadors that not only serve as menacing obstacles and a way to cut through the walls of cake, but also something we haven't mentioned yet. Humor. 
You literally jump and kick enemies to the beat of Black Betty in this game. It's so freaking good, you guys. This can even apply to the player's mechanics as well. In Wandersong, you sing to do just about everything. Communicate with others, make choices, but it also is used for numerous purposes in the game's dungeons. You can sing in a circle to make time move forward or backward, shout in a particular direction to guide platforms, and even belt out specific tunes to cause ledges to appear like a fighting game combo or something. The note wheel never changes, but how you interact with the world can be wildly different depending on where you are in the story. And just when you think you've seen all it has to offer, it innovates with a new ability. So why is this important? What are the benefits of using all the buffalo? Well, to me, it helps a game feel more dynamic and like every element has a purpose. Instead of requiring a giant number of assets that pile up with each new challenge, this lets very few pieces go much further to keep things tidy and neat. And frankly, just feels cleverly designed when I see it. Like more thought went into every aspect when it was being created. This is obviously easier said than done, however, and requires a lot of planning and how it will all piece together. But if it's a part of the design philosophy from the get-go, it can have a massive impact on how enjoyable the experience is. To prove my point, let's take a look at the best example of using all the buffalo I could find, a Kaizo Mario ROM hack called Bun Bun World 2. I know I keep talking about Mario World hacks, but this one literally inspired the entire video, so uh, sorry. Let me walk you through some of the genius here, and maybe it can help inspire some future ideas for game developers out there. From the very first stage, it shows how effective this whole looping back on itself stuff can be. After going through the bottom part of the stage and entering a pipe, it shoots you out from an earlier spot at a much faster speed. And if you maintain that momentum, you can travel on the roof and over the same obstacles to reach the ending. That feels incredible to pull off. The second level has some cool repurposing, like this spike ball that's a hazard when you're coming from the left, but when you respawn it from the right side, you can spin jump on it to reach the higher ledge. But the secret exit is even cooler. Here you need to avoid the green platforms because if you land on them, the ceiling will start to collapse and make it impossible to proceed. But about halfway through, you're required to trigger it, and then have to survive long enough bouncing on these dinos for the wall to lower and allow you to clear it. One more level design example for good measure. This stage is like Hazy Maze Cave, if you spend too much time in the fog, you suffocate. So here, you need to reach the far side to grab a gray pea switch which then allows you to destroy the munchers and backtrack on a newly available route back to the entrance where a pipe is now open. The same hallway feels like an entirely new area. But it's not just the layouts. Hazards respawning when you come from the other side are all over the place. Almost every new obstacle has a different perspective to it by the time you reach the goal. And they even utilize vanilla Mario World mechanics like the cape in basically every way possible. Floating, flying, spin jumps, invincibility frames, and ground pounding to kill enemies are all present in the same level. Each stage only focuses on a couple elements at a time and pushes them to their absolute limits, which really makes the whole game feel cohesive and like every pixel of an object's placement is important and perfectly calculated. In fact, that's really what Kaizo is all about. Since there's only one correct way to go in these gauntlets of death, every piece matters, and when everything is working together to show you the right path, it feels like a well-oiled machine. They'll also throw in some clever trolls now and again to make you think outside the box and discover the new angle you need to hit that green orb. I think what makes Bun Bun World 2 so special is that even typical Kaizo tropes are turned on their head. Usually when you gain a power up, it's used to damage boost past an unavoidable death trap. But in this level, you need to keep it through the gold tape, otherwise you'll be too small and fall to your demise. <sighs> I'm like, mad, but also not at the same time. The funny thing is, fan-made creations like this are often the best at using all the buffalo, and I think it's due to their inherent limitations. Because creators only have so many options in terms of what assets to use, they have to get creative in how they're implemented. If you're building a new game from scratch, it might be easier to just make another enemy or power-up to serve a function. But taking an already established game and seeing just how far you can stretch it is what makes them so unique. Part of the charm of a hack or Mario Maker level is seeing items you thought you understood in new ways and making you rethink how to use them. So is using all the buffalo the best design principle out there? Of course not. 
Every aspect of a game world doesn't have to have multiple purposes, sometimes a sword is just a stabby thing to kill stuff with. But then again... And look, I'll be the first to admit this is much easier to implement in platformers than other genres. But at least in principle, I think it can be used to great effect even in subtle ways. Can you think of any other examples of using all the buffalo in games? What's an experience that just blew your mind when you realized there was a whole other aspect to something you thought was more simple? Let me know in the comments below and let's talk about it. Seriously though, you need to check out Bun Bun World 2. It made me feel smarter just for playing it and that is pretty freaking sweet. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Stay frosty my friends. Today's Patreon shoutout goes to Tiago N, because his name's not Ken and he's a 10 out of 10. If you want to join this list of amazing people and gain some awesome rewards in the process, including a special shoutout just like this one, consider chipping in to support the channel at patreon.com slash snowmangaming. Bye bye